chapter ten of lady jim of curzon street this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox org lady jim of curzon street by fergus hume chapter ten what is love asked leah the next day at twenty minutes past four of a clear wintry afternoon with all his knowledge of five languages demetrius could find no answer and rose from his knees with the feelings of a man who is trying to melt an iceberg with a lucifer match ever since lady jim arrived to keep her appointment in the picture gallery he had been explaining his feelings at length and in the orthodox attitude of a mortal worshipping a goddess he had crossed his t's and dotted his i's with the utmost precision from english he had glided into french to plead the attractions of illicit passion two minutes of german resulted in sentimental assertions of that passion's righteousness and in illustrations of wertherism and immediately before she asked that impossible question he had harked back to her native tongue to impress upon her the solid british common sense of his wooing leah listened to this polyglot love-making with the feeling that she was camping under the tower of babel demetrius might have been a gramophone pouring out recitations from the poets for all the impression his impassionate rhetoric made on her well-trained feelings i suppose all these speeches can be classified under the heading of love she said unkindly when his exhaustion gave her an opportunity of intervening but what is love i have been trying to explain stammered the russian getting on his legs dispiritedly oh your intentions are of the best i gather that much but i am still waiting for a definition love is worship ventured demetrius rashly then why aren't you on your knees i have been on my knees for fifteen minutes really when did you look at your watch my heart told me then your heart is a timekeeper or perhaps a time server if you will permit me to serve you my service will be for all time ah it seems we are immortal then you are he declared passionately every goddess is immortal lady jim laughed this war of words was amusing and pretty but she wished to arrive at some conclusion which would repay her for spending an hour in a coal gallery packed with shockingly bad pictures i am waiting for your definition of love she said at length i cannot explain the impossible it seems to me that you have been trying to do so would you like to hear how i define love his eyes burned like two menacing stars yes he muttered in a husky voice and holding his passions in leash love is sacrifice said leah slowly then i love you he burst out there is no sacrifice i would not make for your dear sake can i believe that try me and he again dropped on his knees get up said lady jim brusquely he did so take a seat he did so look at the floor and nod at me he did so now then she continued feeling relieved that those fierce eyes were not making her flesh creep do you know what you are monsieur demetrius a fool he murmured bitterly his gaze on the parquetry i quite agree with you she rejoined promptly and why because i love you not at all because you don't love katinka aksakoff what has that to do with this he said gloomily everything she is free and i am not she loves you and i don't she will do you good i shall do you harm she can gain your pardon and make your fortune and you can make me happy cried demetrius looking up with the air of one who has found a clinching argument with the crumbs from my husband's table you don't love him the british matron portion of leah revolted against this plain speaking she liked sugar-coated speeches you have no right to say that i have no right to make love to you cried the doctor rising but i do Psh, he snapped his fingers what care i for that english pig your husband as to that young fool who sat beside you last night lady jim clapped her hands and jumped up laughing oh she cried with great enjoyment so it was mr askew's attentions that made you lose your head 
but not my heart i lost that months ago when i first met you ah you cruel woman have i not worshipped and adored you these many days do i not ache here he struck his breast passionately have you not made my life miserable with your looks and smiles and coldness and beauty he seized her hands roughly i love you so much that i even i constantine demetrius could kill you kill you she released herself with a cold laugh that sounds as though you were in earnest but if i could return your love ah he made a step towards her trembling and breathing hard one moment she waved him back and retreated herself to the window supposing i could love you what then i would i would he flung out his hands with a sob what is your price he cried savagely how crudely you put things said lady jim coolly my price is your services to be given blindly and without question and my reward marriage with me demetrius stared and gazed at her with unaffected amazement you mock me he said faintly no i am in earnest it is true that i am not free now but she looked at him steadily you can make me so murder whispered demetrius looking up and down the long empty chill gallery and not at the eve who was tempting him leah blazed out into genuine rage what do you mean she cried stamping her foot not a hair of jim's head shall be harmed then how how sit down and listen she said pointing to a chair i have a deeper feeling for you than you think no leave my hand alone we are now talking business business echoed demetrius blankly lady jim nodded composedly the pleasure can come later you have no money no title no position i can make money he explained rapidly and i can take up again my title of prince which i dropped when i became a doctor as the wife of a russian noble you will have to make your peace with the czar to get these things i will do so through mademoiselle askakoff no there are other ways i am not worthy of katinka and therefore think yourself worthy of me said lady jim calmly thank you there's nothing like being honest but you do not understand oh yes i do i understand that you can make me a cheap sort of princess and in some way can give me money all that you require as my wife you must have the lamp of aladdin then said leah with a shrug my capacity for spending will try even your finances but at the present moment i have not a penny neither has my husband well asked the doctor anxiously now that the plunge was made she found less difficulty in speaking plainly leaning towards him till the perfume of her hair and the close neighbourhood of her whole gracious person nearly maddened him into seizing her in his arms she proceeded rapidly my husband's life is insured for twenty thousand pounds if you as a doctor can arrange to satisfy the insurance company of his death so that we can get the money he will disappear and i in the eyes of the world shall be free to marry you do you mean that i should give him a drug and no i mean harold garth my peasant patient well how stupid you are said lady jim with unfeigned irritation this man garth is very like jim and is apparently dying he can't live another two months then the matter is easily managed can't you see yes replied demetrius whose quick brain seized the feasibility of the scheme at once but will your husband give you up leah nodded not wishing to be too explicit we have arranged that and does he know that his disappearance means our marriage no he thinks you are poor and will do anything for money ah said demetrius sarcastically then the high-born nobleman does not credit me with being a gentleman what does it matter what he thinks said lady jim impatiently we needn't trouble about him after he disappears can it be managed yes if you will promise to marry me when you are free and in possession of this money she gave him both hands i do promise he bent down and kissed them passionately consider it done 
without any scandal assuredly listen the duke wishes to save the life of this garth because he is fond of him yes yes i understand go on i say to the duke that a warm climate will work wonders continued demetrius dramatically he will gladly consent and with this garth i go to to nice or cannes or no said the doctor sharply if i set foot on the continent i may be captured by the secret police i have no wish to take garth with me to siberia he added sarcastically it is not a warm climate the azores madeira jamaica barbados any such place will make him better i don't want him to be made better said the other conspirator naively leave that to me madam garth will die as garth and be buried as myler your husband no no said leah with a shudder i won't have murder you are scrupulous rejoined demetrius with a shrug but make your mind easy garth cannot live he may die on the voyage or he may live for months demetrius shrugged his shoulders again in that case i may have to assist nature no said leah again and very determinedly i could never spend the money with any pleasure if i thought that you you assisted nature she ended faintly not liking to use a strong word the russian looked at her with silent surprise he could not understand why she should be scrupulous in one thing and not in another she contemplated a fraud on the insurance company and bigamistic marriage with him so it was impossible to guess why she should object to the inclusion of a third crime and it would scarcely be murder said demetrius continuing his train of thought aloud he is so ill this poor garth that the relief of death don't interrupted leah who both looked and felt pale i won't have it let the poor man die in peace if he dies otherwise i shall refuse to marry you you may do that in any case said the doctor grimly what hold have i over you there is no need for you to have any hold said lady jim wincing and feeling that she had indeed delivered herself into the power of the enemy but if you think i will not keep my promise you are mistaken i swear to marry you ah well said demetrius with a penetrating look if you do not marry me you cannot marry another since your husband will always be alive he spoke with slow significance oh you make him out to be immortal also said she with an uneasy laugh then felt the necessity of bringing this interview to a conclusion we must part now it will not do for us to be seen talking together i agree said demetrius gravely your proposal alters our relations entirely in society i will speak to you little lady jim nodded and put her handkerchief to her lips with a feeling of nausea now that her scheme was taking shape its outlines appeared rather repulsive to read of such a plot conceived and detailed by a dexterous author was amusing and stimulating to engage in its execution meant worry and a fearful ignorance as to what might happen should things go awry the same difference might be supposed to exist between aldershot manoeuvres and a real battle theorizing in criminality was easy practice would be both difficult and dangerous moreover she might have to pay a very large price for the privilege of engaging in this questionable transaction demetrius would certainly exact his bond in genuine shylock fashion needless to say she had no intention of marrying him and trusted to the providence of the peacock fetish to avoid the necessity though at the moment she saw no means whereby she could escape fulfilling her promise this reflection almost made her draw back and yet she was not under the doctor's thumb and could extricate herself even at this eleventh hour by denying everything should he dare to speak out but a second thought of her desperate need of money a sordid vision of cheap hotels and ready-made frocks a shuddering remembrance that the future as it now stood meant limited pocket-money and the everlasting boredom of jim's society turned the scale in favour of the venture be bold be bold said the warning of the door in the old fairy tale and leah thought the advice worth taking but she forgot the concluding words be not too bold i leave details to you she said to her companion when they had concluded their nefarious bargain madam i relieve you of all responsibility said demetrius now quite his grave restrained self but should i tell the duke that your husband is suffering from consumption you will endorse my statement i trust 
consumption jim oh lord he's as healthy as a pig he will not be if he takes a certain medicine said the man dryly leah had a conscience though for years it had been persistently snubbed into holding its peace after all jim was her husband and she had no right to sanction tricks being played on his robust health you don't mean her voice died away nervously i mean business demetrius flashed out i love you and i mean to win you the price that you ask shall be paid without harm to jim or this man garth i swear it in that case leah extended her hand to withdraw it suddenly before the russian could rain kisses on its soft whiteness a choking sensation new to one of her superb health made her gasp frantically after the breath which seemed to be leaving her with unexpected force came a new sensation this abominable playing with the lives and hearts of men stirred up to vehement protest a hitherto unknown better self which overwhelmed her with wave upon wave of reproachful shame conscience uppermost for once in her greedy selfish animal life stripped the contemplated sin of its allurements and she recoiled before an inward vision of the horror her baser nature was creating it might prove to her what the monster proved to frankenstein and haunt her with nightmare insistence for the remainder of an unbearable life so weak madam asked demetrius reading the secret handwriting on the wall like a very daniel the sneer nerved her and she strove desperately to escape from the light of heaven into the material darkness that would not reveal her sin unclothed and shameless no she cried in a loud ringing voice i i again the celestial light mercilessly and mercifully disclosed the inward foulness of that fair seeming sin and the sight beat down her pride and courage into nothingness i take it all back she stuttered broken up and panic-struck forget don't move in in something clicked in her throat and only by a violent effort did she repress the climbing hysteria incapable of speech and only anxious to escape from this extraordinary influence which compelled her to face the powers of darkness in their naked horror she passed swiftly down the long echoing gallery not till she was safe in her own room did she halt to consider why she had fled her brain was now clear and the actual world resumed its wonted aspect her face was still white her lips still quivered her soul was still shaken by the visitation but with a courage worthy of a better cause she sat down and fought with her fears till the colour returned and the nerves came under control yet her material nature could not grasp that the terrible gift of the interior sight had been hers for one short moment i'm a fool she assured herself harshly and she was for as the walls of the flesh closed round her soul to darken it anew her good angel who had wrought the miracle weeping for the blind that would not see and the deaf that would not hear left her despairingly then the powers of darkness soothed her into such contentment that she laughed scornfully at her late folly and adopted their explanation i'm run down with all this worry said lady jim i really need a tonic End of chapter ten chapter eleven of lady jim of curzon street this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org lady jim of curzon street by fergus hume chapter eleven a triple knock at the door both interrupted leah's meditations and annoyed her as she was far from wishing for company it could not be jim as he usually banged the panels impatiently and walked in before the invitation to enter could be heard through the noise of his tattoo besides jim for obvious reasons connected with askew had made himself scarce for the last four-and-twenty hours should it be a visitor leah resolved to decline conversation especially with one of her own sex but the women of the house-party so rarely ventured into lady jim's sitting-room that she concluded the disturber to be some servant with a message perhaps jim had broken his head while skating or had made a hole in the ice if so his death would greatly simplify matters 
come in she cried impatiently and to her surprise lionel presented himself with a somewhat diffident look oh it's you padre lady jim had picked up the word from a sandhurst cadet what's the matter anything wrong what should be wrong inquired kames closing the door and remaining on the inside oh i don't know i always expect bad news when i see a lawyer's letter or a parson's face well has lady canvey been converted or has jim gone to that place where the climate forbids skating nothing of the sort has happened said lionel dryly i have merely come to chat with you sit down then though i warn you i don't feel companionable you are worried my dear man when am i anything else but worried with jim for a husband and the duke behaving like shylock at his worst you and jim have made a mess of things i don't know about jim said lionel resenting this ungrateful speech but i did my best to put matters in the right light oh lord who wanted a right light the less light on jim's and my affairs the better a few white lies would have resulted in a larger sum than that miserable two hundred with which the duke insulted us i am not in the habit of telling lies white or black lady james i dare say you parsons are so ridiculously punctilious as if diplomatic lies were not as oil on the troubled waters of this world i did not come to discuss this said lionel seeing how utterly impossible she was but to help you in your trouble what trouble i don't know i was reading in the library when a feeling came to me that i must see you at once that you needed assistance leah looked rather queer what could he possibly know of her late experience telepathy i suppose well that may be the scientific name for the divine spirit the what i believe that the impulse to seek you came from above you are in danger am i of being bored to death you can't deny that you are in trouble of some sort i can see it in your expression my trouble is my own i share it with no one then you are in pray don't question me snapped leah with a nervous glance around this interference of the unseen with her material affairs was both weird and uncomfortable she could not deny the panic that had driven her headlong from the security of the flesh and it was remarkable that lionel unsummoned and unsought should seek her at so critical a moment the feeling that he was meddling with what did not concern him annoyed her the more i wish you would not frighten me she cried with an angry determination to stop this uncanny business perhaps it is your conscience that is frightening you how dare you say that because there is something serious the matter or i should not have been called to your assistance i never called you then your good angel did i don't believe in such things do you believe in anything yes she said defiantly in myself that is a poor help in time of trouble i have managed very well hitherto can you substantiate that statement seeing how embarrassed your worldly affairs are at this moment lady jim could find no direct answer parsons have nothing to do with worldly matters she muttered averting her eyes very true but if i can offer spiritual consolation take it to lady canvey she needs it more than i do i doubt that or the call would not have come it's a false alarm padre she said jeeringly i don't want to be preached at and you're suffering from indigestion or softening of the brain well lady james said lionel rising with a sigh your limitations may lead you to look at the matter in that light but if i can do nothing for you i can only retire after asking your pardon as i do for my intrusion and he made for the door 
her mood changed with feminine rapidity and she beckoned imperatively that he should remain disguise it as she would to kames his sudden coming on the top of her late puzzling experience drove her to acknowledge that something outside the material was at work leah was too clever a woman to deny the existence of more things in heaven and earth than came within the scope of her knowledge it is the duty of your parsons to pry into the secrets of souls i suppose she said leaning her elbow on the chair arm and her chin on her hand but what interest can you have in my soul if i have one i as other servants of the master interest myself in all souls that you may save them only christ can do that i may deny his power to do so i may deny him and so fall as peter fell said lionel sadly yet he repented with bitter weeping i am not a tearful woman she retorted and turned to look into the fire she did not wish to meet his eyes when she spoke the ensuing acknowledgment you are a good man lionel and and you may be able to help me kames resumed his seat i hope so but i can only point the way to a better helper and one more powerful she continued to gaze at the burning coals i was frightened a few minutes before you entered she said abruptly by what that is the question you must answer by something which made me see what a horrid nature i have lionel was silent for a few moments not quite sure of his speech the unseen presses closely around us he remarked at length and at times reveals itself for instance a contemplated sin may be prevented by a spiritual influence informing the intelligence how terrible the consequences of such a sin may be it was the sin itself rather than its consequence which frightened me murmured leah so softly that lionel caught but one word what is that you say about sin lady jim's cunning made her shirk confession nothing oh nothing she said hurriedly only it seems to me that everything pleasant is a sin in your eyes dead sea fruit replied kames earnestly fair to the eye foul to the taste if you turn devoutly to the spiritual the material pleasures of this world lose their attractiveness perhaps she said sceptically but many things goody-goody people of your sort shudder at are attractive you can't deny that i have no wish to satan always supplies us with rose-coloured spectacles through which to contemplate his works lady jim rose and walked up and down the narrow limits of the room twisting her hands in a nervous hesitating way quite unlike her usually calm decisive self i wish you would not talk nonsense she snapped it is absurd to believe in a personal devil and in a possible hell also i suppose you would say oh she said carelessly scientists have explained that away and the inquisition of the middle ages denied that the earth went round the sun said kames grimly but i understand that it does clever but not convincing what is the use of talking nursery theology and cheap science to me what can you say that is likely to do me good the patient must be frank with his physician hinted lionel oh we always tell the exact truth to doctor and lawyer said lady jim scornfully because we fear for our bodies and our property but who tells the truth to a parson those who are convinced of sin in that case i may as well hold my tongue i am not convinced of anything not even if i ought to make you my father confessor i cannot compel your confidence on the other hand i cannot help you unless unless quite so let me think and turning her back on him she went to the window the early winter gloom was blotting out the distant landscape but near at hand the spectral glare of the snow revealed blackly the figures of homeward bound skaters 
the cold deadness of so sinister a world did not tend to soothe leah's overstrung nerves and shrouded nature could give her no counsel had it been a summer's twilight of nightingales and roses of sleeping blossoms and murmuring leaves she would have recovered sufficient spirit to scoff but this arctic waste livid and still in the half-light reminded her of the frozen hell in the deadly chills of which shuddered dante the seer and the virile saxon word hinted at the possible if not at the probable of course it was all very ridiculous and her system was out of order nevertheless she felt that some kindly human comfort and advice might restore her tormented mind to its usual peace and whatever she said to lionel he would not dare to repeat as a cousin as a gentleman as a priest his lips would be triply sealed and he might be able to point out a less dangerous path than that towards which the need of money was driving her he was a good fellow too and honest enough in spite of his superstition she decided to speak and came back to her chair had she been less material she could have heard in the stillness the rustling wings of a returning angel lionel looked at her inquiringly she was about to speak hurriedly lest the good impulse should pass away when jim's tattoo was heard with a snap leah closed her lips as he lumbered red-faced hardy and essentially fleshy into the room the mere sight of his tangible commonplace made the woman thank her stars that she had not blundered into hysterical frankness hello lionel hello leah sittin in the twilight and talkin secrets eh mind some light he clicked the ivory knob near the door and the room sprang into vivid being had a jolly day's skatin ye should a come leah no end of a lark feels sick this polite question was asked because she shaded her eyes from the glare no but i can't stand wild bulls charging into a room might call it a china shop chuckled jim glancing disparagingly at the knick-knackery nerves slack i'll bet fresh air and exercise a cheerful company is what you want leah i'm likely to get the last with you she rejoined witheringly for the overpowering vitality of the man made her wince well lionel's here been no catch in the way of fun i expect seems to have given you the hump goin old man all right i'll cheer her up see you at dinner the curate nodded and went out since jim's plunge into the middle of their conversation he had not uttered a word for the interruption had jarred on him as on lady jim moreover he departed with an intuitive feeling that the golden moment had passed and this was truly the case when she next saw him leah wondered why she had so nearly made a fool of herself and indeed she was already wondering while jim obviously embarrassed discoursed in a breezy blundering way with an attempt at connubial fondness poor old girl he said sitting opposite to her looking fresh and handsome and essentially manly awfully sorry you're chippy if i'd known i'd a come back to keep you company are the heavens falling asked leah listlessly jim as usual could not follow this recondite speech don't know what you're talking about he remarked good-humouredly and bustling to the bell you're a peg too low leah tell you what we'll have tea here and a talk if you don't mind his wife nodded wondering if he was about to confess his possible mormonism she did not think so as jim never confessed anything unless it was dragged piecemeal out of him her feelings at this moment did not lean towards cross-examination so she let him ring the bell and order tea without using her too ready tongue in fact she unbent so far as to make use of him get me a dose of sal volatile jim she ordered there's a bottle on my dressing-table poor old girl said the sympathetic jim again and stumbling into the next room with eager haste leah smiled to herself this ready obedience argued a guilty conscience after jim dosed her he was tactful enough to hold his tongue and improve the fire without clattering the poker and tongs 
then he pulled down the blinds and drew the curtains and altered the shades of the electric so that leah might not be overpowered by the glare it's quite like a new honeymoon she said sarcastically the drug was doing its renovating work and her original devil was returning to a swept and garnished house with seven other spirits more wicked than himself jim took the remark seriously and coloured with pleasure i believe we'd get on rippin said he enthusiastically if we only had the money i believe we'd be as happy as birds they can't be very happy in this cold weather replied leah seeing plainly that jim's amiability was owing to a selfish fear of reproval for his iniquities here's the tea i don't want any just now as the sal volatile is doing me good you can eat oh can't i just said jim when the footman left and he was filling himself a cup the skatin's given me an appetite sides i want to get into form as i've something serious to say about this insurance business leah looked up suddenly i thought you had given that the go-by no drawled her husband not meeting her eyes course the pater's a good sort and all that but his arrangement will give us a howlin bad time for the next few years so i told you well then jim fiddled nervously with a piece of toast why not get the twenty thousand it could be managed of course with some little difficulty through the russian johnny demetrius yes you've seen him then to-day he'll see the thing through what's his price leah smiled blandly as she thought of what jim would say did she reply honestly to this question but she did not intend to it seemed to her that jim was driving her towards the very path which lionel unknowingly wished her to avoid it was useless to fight against fate so she decided and like many another person she laid the blame on those scapegoats the stars she was now completely dominated by the selfish influence of the great god mammon and the lesser sin of lying was swallowed up in the greater one of idolatry he'll want a few thousands of course she said mendaciously but as yet we have not fixed any sum hum muttered jim suspiciously i thought he'd want something more than money leah rose indignantly and proclaimed a virtue that her conscience assured her she might yet lose i am an honest woman jim she said haughtily and married or unmarried i should never allow any man to make love to me seems to me you do only to pass away the time i stop short whim when their hearts are broken growled her husband upon my soul leah i'm straighter than you are i doubt that since you swear by what you haven't got jim rashly became aggressively virtuous i've not been a bad sort of husband to you leah i have seen so little of you that it is rather difficult for me to give an opinion she said resting her elbow on the mantelpiece mrs baring may be in a better position to judge of your virtues kames turned white with emotion and he rose from his low chair as though worked by springs it's a lie he growled hoarsely i never married her married who the lady you talk about the lady mr askew talked about you mean i merely mention her name it is not her name she is lola fajardo of the estancia san Iago, so mr askew explained oh if you're goin to make a row do i ever make rows asked lady jim impatiently you don't care enough about me to raise cain said jim rather sorry for himself i swear i'd be a different man if you were a different woman every husband in the divorce court witness box makes the same excuse sit down jim and let us talk over the matter quietly your infidelities have long since converted us from man and wife into a business firm to earn money but leah i swear by that soul you know nothing about she flashed out contemptuously talk sense if you are capable of doing so you have been trying to dodge this explanation ever since you met mr askew last night in the smoking-room but now that we've stumbled on an opening perhaps you will explain 
explain what all that mr askew did not tell me oh he's been making something out of nothing the silly ass protested jim sitting down and handling the poker with a fervent wish that he could use it on the sailor's head i met senorita forharded at lima and later buenos aires her brother asked me out to their estancia in the camp of argentina near rosario and i stopped there for a month bit of luck came my way and i pulled her from under a beastly mustang that would have kicked the life out of her she took a fancy to me cause i saved her life is that all well i went again to san iago last year your third visit to south america since our marriage yes said jim sullenly and i met lola i mean senorita fajardo oh don't apologize lola is a pretty name and she's a pretty woman and i'm flesh and blood cried jim getting up to work himself into a rage i met her during my second visit and went again to the estancia on my third it was no use lugging a title round for these mouldy hotel keepers always make a chap pay for having a handle to his name so i called myself baring james baring james baring bachelor bachelor certainly i haven't married her and if askew says i have he's a liar and assuredly a marplot said leah dryly since he has exploded your romance i understood from him that this lady loves you so she does and you love her jim wriggled oh go on go on kick a chap when he's down if i had intended to kick you would have been black and blue by now mr james baring but you needn't flatter yourself that my feelings are hurt in any way you're not worth it other women think differently lola fajardo for instance well i can't help that can i if you'd been a different sort of woman i'd have you said that before had we not better get to business what business the insurance business i don't care for you and you show very plainly that you don't care for me it is useless for us to struggle together like a couple of ill-matched dogs in leash give me fifteen thousand of this money and then you can marry your lola woman jim turned white again you seem jolly anxious to get rid of me can you wonder if i do how many women would take this scandalous matter as quietly as i do it's not scandalous said kames fiercely she thinks that i am a bachelor and i'm not even engaged to her i have tried to be true to you leah declared jim pathetically his wife shrugged her shoulders it was rather late in the day for jim to talk sentiment besides being a waste of time well she asked facing him squarely jim read her purpose in a very flinty face i'll do what you want he said weakly then there's no more to be said remarked leah coldly moving towards the door of her bedroom demetrius will explain if you will afford him half an hour's private conversation leah do you really mean it i have meant it from the first moment you put the idea into my head she said in a harsh voice this underhand love-making of yours only makes me the more determined but there was no don't lie jim a man can no more love two women than he can serve two masters is it to be lola fajardo or myself i leave it to you leah then i choose the fifteen thousand pounds she said and vanished into the bedroom jim took an impulsive step towards the door but the sharp click of a turning key showed him that he was locked out for ever that evening leah talked so gaily and looked so beautiful that her father-in-law was absolutely fascinated is it all right between you and james he asked graciously yes leah assured him we understand one another thoroughly end of chapter eleven chapter twelve of lady jim of curzon street this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain 
for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. lady jim of curzon street by fergus hume chapter twelve leah welcomed the new year at firmingham with the fervent hope that its bounty would bestow the insurance money and rid her of an official husband it really seemed as though providence or the fetish was in a benign mood for jim caught the worst of colds while skating being confined to an undesired bed and fed with food tasteless to a cultivated palate he lost both flesh and temper demetrius talked gravely of weak lungs and hinted at inherited consumption the duke was anxious but scarcely surprised and recalled similar cases of a grandmother two ancestors and a rackety uncle lady jim encouraged these pulmonary recollections for obvious reasons she and demetrius winked privately at one another like the celebrated augurs when they heard the old man's lamentations nature was acting strictly on the lines of the russian's proposed medicine and there was no need to dose jim into a sickly likeness of garth day by day he grew as white-faced as haggard and as lean until he became alarmed at the anxiety of providence to forward the schemes of himself and leah but there was no end to the kindness of an overruling fate jim's illness afforded his wife the opportunity of posing as a sister of mercy and she fussed round the patient so ostentatiously that the duke was quite touched he began to think that leah was a true ministering angel and not the money-wasting doll he had considered her to be jim grinned as leah measured medicine and fed him with gruel and read him interesting bits from the sporting journals i believe i'm going to get well he chuckled why so dear asked his wife who was profuse of adjectives in private so that they might slip out the more easily in public you look so uncommon dismal it is necessary to keep up appearances leah assured him besides this will be the last chance of my doing anything for you in future lola will soothe your weary pillow after which and similar passages of arms jim would curse himself to sleep and wake up to accuse his wife of wishing to poison him this fortunate illness kept lady jim at firmingham when the house-party disintegrated but as the duke was a twaddling old ass and jim the most trying of patients leah looked upon her ten days boredom as a kind of lenten penance besides she had frequent confabulations with demetrius to settle details of the plot already the doctor had explained to the duke that garth would die easier in the tropics and funchal had been selected as the most agreeable place for his demise and then asked lady jim your husband must go to jamaica to wait events what events those which i propose to bring about retorted demetrius who had his reasons for not explaining himself too fully leah did not question him closely with a selfish regard for her own safety in case anything might leak out she preferred that the doctor should arrange matters in his own way but she obeyed instructions to the extent of hinting to the duke that kingston was the very best place for dear jim's weak lungs will you go with him asked pentland anxiously oh no said lady jim sweetly we mustn't make too much fuss over him else he'll think he's going to die he might sighed the duke i had an uncle and he described the sufferings of old lord george for the tenth time leah comforted him after the manner of one bildad a shoeite oh kingston will do jim no end of good my dear duke it won't cure one lung but it may patch up the other and then you know if he gets worse i can always reach him in fourteen days does demetrius think he will die asked the duke piteously he doesn't think poor jim will ever be so strong as he was said leah gravely but he'll hang on with care just like my grandmother muttered the duke and then detailed the sufferings of a dowager duchess who couldn't be kept alive beyond the age of sixty if jim lives till that age i shall be content said leah 
are you thinking of the insurance money demanded pentland with sudden anger what insurance money oh yes i think jim did mention something about an insurance he gets it if he lives till sixty really i don't quite understand duke but i'm sure it's all right i hope so my dear has he made his will no why should he because in the event of his dying the insurance money should be left to you no will means trouble leah had never thought of a will as it seemed natural that the money should come to her without the necessity of paying lawyers bills but her quick brain seized the chance of smoothing the way to acquiring the fortune with as little trouble as possible and she promptly cornered the duke you speak to him she suggested and this the duke did with the result that a will leaving the money to leah was drawn up and signed after some opposition by jim he did not at all relish the carrying out of this necessary step it was too like preparing a death certificate to please jim however as a reward for his obedience demetrius set him on his legs and jim went to torquay with the devoted leah but when he was settled in a comfortable hotel as an interesting invalid and with a superfluity of pretty girls to soothe him with sympathy lady jim left him for a round of visits to various country houses now that the duke was out of sight jim's connubial comforts were out of mind but leah left strict injunctions that he was not to put on flesh within the month she was to see him start for jamaica and impressed upon him the necessity of looking quite ready to depart for a place where jim had no desire to go i don't see why you want to make a holy show of me grumbled jim we must make your death appear as plausible as possible but i don't want to look like a living skeleton oh i don't think that lola will mind said leah cruelly and started out to enjoy herself in the best of spirits while at lord sargon's seat in shropshire she met askew in the company of the fixture the young man's betrothed was extremely like a dairy-maid and her frock set lady jim's teeth on edge if she could combine colours that did not match she always did so and her character was as colourless as her wardrobe was gaudy marjorie was the creature's name and her conversation was the papa mamma of a squeaking doll how much are you paying for her asked leah after satisfying herself that the young lady was really a woman five thousand a year replied the lieutenant sulkily what a bargain don't laugh at me he implored you know there is but one woman in the world for me so you told me lola what's her name some one nearer and dearer than her he murmured with what the americans call goo-goo eyes whereat lady jim laughed and allowed him to fetch and carry and sit on his hind legs and bark prettily like a well-trained lap-dog it amused her and kept him on tenterhooks the only annoying thing was that marjorie seemed to care little for this annexation of her lover she much preferred a fox-hunting squire who talked stables and glowered on askew for not appreciating the dairymaid in this capture of another woman's man leah combined pleasure with business she did not wish to spoil jim's little game with the spanish lady and it would never do for askew to detail mr baring's past in a quarter where such betrayal would lead to trouble by this time the amorous sailor was the slave of beauty so lady jim was sufficiently mistress of his will to limit his correspondence this she did one evening after dinner while admiring marjorie's new frock yellow and green murmured leah when she and askew filled up a corner and watched frantic people playing bridge poached egg on spinach if you design her gowns mr askew i should advise a less lavish use of primary colours she means well he muttered apologetically people who need excuses for existing always do retorted lady jim but she is really a sweetly simple girl with two ideas neither of which includes you my dear boy i am sure you will be very happy together doing cake-walks doing cake-walks that sort of dress always makes me think of south carolina and the old kentucky home you know they invented cake-walks there i believe but i forgot you prefer places below the equator 
i never think of south america he protested of course not the jewel is more attractive than the casket when did you last hear from signorita fajardo i never had a letter from her in my life she is cautious it seems are you i don't write to her if that is what you mean i did love her what a polite thing to say to me but i don't any longer you see i thought that bearing your there's nothing in that said lady jim quickly there never really was and if you really love this estancia lady why not marry her i am engaged already to me or to that pretty vivacious girl over there as marjorie was looking particularly like a wooden dutch doll at the moment askew reddened i wish you wouldn't say these things lady jim lady james lady james then marjorie can't help herself it seems to me she has to that intelligent young man with the face like a sheep and the manners of a costermonger they were boy and girl together and are still from the infantile look of them i quite expect to see their nurse arrive you know it won't do said leah gravely here i am making fun of marjorie and you aren't man enough to stand up for her the young man coloured still deeper and mumbled something about a woman's privilege shortly he made a lame excuse and left leah to devote himself to marjorie who was not grateful for the attention leah did not mind she had learned that askew did not correspond with lola fajardo and had no intention of doing so therefore there was little likelihood that jim's fettered past would ever become known at the estancia san Iago. being really a good-natured woman with her affections thoroughly under control leah half decided to loosen her apron strings and let askew lead his bargain to the altar but this she did not do for two obtrusive reasons firstly the fox-hunting squire and marjorie were made for one another and secondly it would be just as well to keep the sailor under her eye for the next year she did not wish him to hark back to lima for melodramatic purposes after a very pleasant visit thanks to askew's infatuation lady jim returned to curzon street there she found a letter from demetrius announcing that he and garth had sailed from madeira early in the previous week and that it would be as well if lord james kames journeyed forthwith to jamaica leah promptly sent an answer to her accomplice at funchal a telegram to jim a paragraph to a society paper and a lengthy letter of sorrowful forebodings to the duke then she sat down to wait events and meanwhile considered the situation pentland was all right thanks to her cajoling before she left firmingham he had arranged to free the income to pay the debts and to allow her to occupy the curzon street house until such time as jamaica should kill or cure jim that interesting invalid had gone halves over the cheque and leah's purse still contained over fifty pounds which would do for the present but she intended to get a few hundreds from the duke by playing off jim's sickly looks and her own lonely condition of grass widowhood it was really very satisfactory and she found it hard to look miserable as in duty bound when pentland arrived to see the last of jim leah arranged that the parting between father and son should be in town she did not want to have a bereaved father bothering at southampton the journey back to town after jim's dispatch would be boring at the best and her consolatory powers were not great you look disgustingly fit said leah when jim was established on the drawing-room sofa with a rug and a few unnecessary medicine bottles and other sick-room paraphernalia sorry i can't be more of a corpse growled the invalid but it's not easy to pretend you're a goner when ye feel fit to jump over the moon try and cough louder suggested his wife shan't it hurts my throat hang it i've lost three stone i believe you want me dead in real earnest lady jim thought for a moment no i don't she said truly enough you haven't treated me over well and i should have been a different woman had you been a different man divorce court lingo said jim remembering what she had said at firmingham and with a derisive laugh all the same i hope you'll have a good time in south america why not in jamaica because you've got to be thoroughly sick there demetrius will come along later with garth's corpse and oh drop it what about the money my share 
i'll get the cash as soon as you are sent home me what for ain't i goin to disappear of course said leah impatiently but demetrius has to embalm your body and bring you home to the family vault i say don't cried jim uneasily that's the other johnny you're talkin about leah he looked round cautiously i hope demetrius won't polish off that poor fellow he's a sort of relative of mine you know don't worry your head said lady jim calmly garth's dying as fast as he can he may be dead by this time for all we know and don't think that i would allow demetrius to be so wicked she cried with virtuous indignation i'm not a criminal oh lord was all jim could find to say as he thought of what they were doing and conversation ended for the time being leah went to the theatre and supper at the savoy that evening leaving jim to practise coughing amongst the useless medicine bottles next day both pentland and his eldest son arrived at eleven and were informed by a sad-faced wife that her dear husband would travel to southampton by the afternoon train at the sight of leah's dismal looks and attentive care frith expressed his opinion that women were protean never thought you cared so much for jim he said bluntly oh i don't for a moment say that i think jim is a good man was leah's artistic reply and we've had our tiffs like other married people but jim's my husband after all and he has his good points what are they lady jim was not prepared with a catalogue of her husband's perfections oh i don't know she muttered vaguely he drinks in moderation you know that's something there's no virtue in resisting a non-existent temptation said the marquis grimly jim doesn't come of a drinking family of a consumptive one i believe retorted leah softly frith was nettled at the implied slight not at all he said with unusual gruffness look at me but that poor garth oh he i don't understand and if you frith coloured as he met her derisive eyes and devoted himself to his brother lady jim left the affectionate trio together lengthening out their farewells and retired laughing to her room it was really amusing to think that jim who was as healthy as a trout in a pond should be wept over and coddled and pitied and generally elevated to a sainthood the business was serious enough no doubt but leah could not help seeing the humorous side she felt unequal to keeping a grave face while the comedy in the drawing-room was being played and therefore did not rejoin her husband till the principal comedians had departed we are a couple of rotters said jim gloomily when she appeared speak for yourself my dear she retorted coolly well and what did they say never you mind you'd only snigger over a father taking leave of his dying son oh i did not know that the duke had seen harold garth leah cried her husband fiercely you're a never mind whatever you are i'm another did the duke leave a cheque for me asked leah more business-like than sympathetic jim banged about among the medicine bottles five hundred dear man cried his wife snatching the cheque from his very reluctant hand i must go and dress for the journey won't you kiss me leah quavered jim really moved and quite forgetting the rascally plot in which she was taking so prominent a part at the door she turned with an expression of withering scorn keep your kisses for your wife mr baring cried this too previous widow and left him to digest the insult at his leisure End of chapter twelve chapter thirteen of lady jim of curzon street this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org lady jim of curzon street by fergus hume chapter thirteen the paragraph sent by leah to her pet editor intimated concisely to the tuft-hunting world of tom dick and harriet that the suddenly developed pulmonary complaint of lord james kames necessitated his wintering in jamaica this intelligence surprised the clubs as jim's hectoring voice and devotion to damp field sport had always suggested aggressively sound lungs 
never knew him to be chippy in his life growled one man who admired leah as much as he hated jim for possessing her what's his game this time i wonder perhaps he wants to get away from his wife hinted a pigeon of jim's plucking bit of a tongue hasn't she tongue be hanged she has both wit and beauty the pigeon sniggered knowing the speaker's devotion to delilah oh kames appreciates those qualities in another man's wife scandal scandal murmured a meek member blessed with a spouse whose looks prevented temptation kames has dined with us many times but i never saw no you wouldn't struck in a sporting baronet whom leah snubbed on every possible occasion jim likes red-haired women then why doesn't he stick to the one he's legally entitled to because she sticks to him if she'd only syndicate her admirers in the d c jim would be after her like an indian mosquito in search of a new arrival i'll bet there's some petticoat in this jamaica business and the sportsman looked round for some one to pander to his besetting sin but no one gave him a chance of committing it contradiction and argument arrived with the oldest inhabitant of clubland whose memory was as exasperating as his verbosity wrong all wrong he purred like the tame cat he had been for half a century kames is really consumptive i remember his grandmother dying of tuberculosis it's in the family along with gout and water on the brain oh bosh if jim was sick he'd sin more judiciously i never knew that damnation depended upon health was the retort take a case in point during the great exhibition leah's admirer cut short a much dreaded anecdote she'll make a lovely widow i don't believe in second-hand brides myself said the horsey man venturing an epigram sides her tongue cuts like a knife even the mare's shy when she kicks wit wit explained the admirer who misread french memoirs she is madame de rambouillet without a history hm she hasn't published one yet but i dare say tut tut interrupted the ancient madame de rambouillet was and lady james is entirely respectable and the horse is the noblest of all animals snapped the baronet may be though the beast doesn't improve your morals and the laugh was with the oldest inhabitant wonder if kames will die pondered the man who saw leah as a probable widow and a possible wife lay you ten to five he won't you will lose you will most assuredly lose said the octogenarian very consumptive family the kames and our friend is just the sort of healthy man to depart suddenly where to asked the pigeon hush droned the meek member that's a serious question to jim finished the racing man smartly but i don't care jim dead or alive is equally useless to me oh he isn't in your debt then catch me trusting him not much but what's the use of talking obituary notices let's bridge if your play is as bad as your grammar i prefer to stand out said methuselah and the symposium broke up in time to prevent bickering between crabbed age and irreverent youth there were many such talks during the nine minutes wonder of jim's unexpected sickness and it was generally considered that he would return in spirits of wine to the family vault leah did not hear these encouraging prognostications so conducive to the entire success of the plot she was tolerating life at san remo under the hired roof of a truly great dame who wished to disentangle her from the golden nets of ultra fast society a grass widow has to be more careful to keep up appearances than the genuine crape article even at the risk of being bored by highly placed humanity as dull as stainless lady hengist and her friends belong to that seventh heaven where newly rich paris and the mammons who cocker them seek admittance in vain 
social laws differ from those of nature inasmuch as the gilded scum does not invariably rise to the top hence the creation of the over-discussed smart set which is taken by the suburban reader of backstairs journalism as representatives of the british aristocracy lord hengist came of an autochthonous family which had been at home when william the conqueror raided the ancestral cabin his wife was descended from a knight who emigrated from normandy in ten sixty six with apparently several million others judging by the claims put forward by those who enter the peerage this alliance they were too great to talk of mere marriage resulted in two children not made of ordinary clay but compounded of the superlative porcelain sort their parents possessed a genuine mediaeval castle as uncomfortable as the builders knew how to make it which had the rare distinction of possessing a state bedroom in which elizabeth had never slept the family archives read like the book of numbers and their ancestors had made history at opulent wages for the benefit of the hengist coffers the men had sided with the stuarts and ratted to the guelphs the women bloomed in lely and kneller portraits in loosely slipping clothes with pastoral accessories and finally the present head of the house with four seats two children a charming wife and a large income lived comfortably on the loot of ages of all these things lord and lady hengist were so proud that they had no need to exhibit pride well born as leah kames was the pleasant if somewhat stately and stiff life of these genuine rulers wearied her intensely bread and milk is insipid after a repast of ardolon in aspic and a motor flight in more exhilarating than a donkey ride moreover it annoyed her to see how sensibly the hengists spent their many pounds a day they could have had much more fun for the money had they known the right shops but they patronized out-of-date establishments where the goods were of an excellent quality but just five minutes behind the newest things of course this was leah's figurative way of saying that the hengists came out of the ark they always bought the wrong things at the wrong shops and had a middle-class eye to the lasting quality of the goods they purchased they were clothed rather than dressed and being colour-blind invariably chose garments which matched abominably with their complexions in a word the hengists were so commonplace as to be original lady jim could not understand why they should have been thrust into positions which they could not fill it was like bringing cows into the drawing-room it's so hard for me to taste the pleasures of self-denial complained hengist one day as they sauntered on the promenade i don't think it is wise to attempt the extraction of sunbeams from cucumbers said leah dryly dean swift said that but he was an egotist replied hengist in his serious way that reminded lady jim of lionel at his worst it is more blessed to give than to receive you know is it indeed who said so the wisest and most loving of mankind and it is a true saying i assure you that if i deny myself something i greatly desire and send the money which would have purchased the gratification to a charity i feel absolutely happy i don't think i ever tried that experiment you will not know true happiness till you do lady james then i must make a bid for paradise she answered privately thinking that the man talked sad nonsense it's a dreadful thing to be able to have the moon for the asking went on hengist reflectively that's your epigrammatic way of putting it i suppose but the moon won't drop from her sphere for me howl as i may you are very lucky to, to command the planet lord hengist so the world thinks but it forgets that there is the curse of satiety is there i never knew it existed i only wish i could cram the twelve hours of the day with twenty-four of pleasure have you ever had everything you wished for lady james no said leah promptly i'd 
have the sun as well as the moon and the stars thrown in if i had my way only to be bored by the acquisition of the lot me bored oh dear no i am too stupid it is only clever people like yourself who suffer from ennui i only wish i were a roman empress with provinces for a dowry those dear women knew how to live but in the majestic pages of gibbon who oh that man who came to think he was the roman empire now his work would bore me i'm not stupid enough to appreciate him julia this was lady hengist juliet and i read gibbon during the honeymoon and received much instruction oh lord said lady jim as though honeymoons were not disagreeable enough without that the idea made her laugh consumedly in her mind's eye she saw this new paolo and francesca reading heavy prose in ten volumes but hengist did not even smile he had absolutely no sense of humour besides he considered his companion's chatter painfully frivolous and sighed to think that she had such a light nature leah still laughing glanced sideways i shall begin to think you are discontented lord hengist i am that i cannot do the good i should like to do both julia and i wish to benefit mankind the twelve labours of hercules with no thanks for their accomplishment we don't want thanks but results said hengist austerely and we can commence in a small way next summer we intend to invite five hundred whitechapel children to the castle will you come and help us to entertain them lady james delighted yawned leah for the man spoke like a copy-book but i hope you'll wash them first it will prevent disease and give some new soap a philanthropic advertisement hengist eyed her suspiciously he was a very very dull young lord large-hearted and unintelligent who took life so seriously that he had almost forgotten how to laugh england clean england contented england happy he constantly started crusades to bring on a premature millennium and earned his reward after the manner of reformers by being abused in halfpenny newspapers as one who attempted to avert certain revolution by stuffing the starving with sweets lady jim thought him a bore and a prig and too virtuous to be amusing but that he and his wife were of use to her she would not have endured this presentation of his year before last tree of knowledge apples he never plucked fresh fruit and his eve was quite as blind as he in discerning up-to-date harvests still hengist was a sort of bellwether leading a flock of prize sheep towards a closely guarded fold leah liked the fun and money and adulation of the smart set but she had no notion of being a shut-out parry from that dull paradise that the newly rich longed for besides its very dullness gave a fillip to her enjoyment of the larky amusements of those who could not enter the sacred ark i am really very fond of children she said to do away with the effect of her last remark i wish i had some myself and she sighed very prettily hilda frith is more fortunate than i with her two dear babies both girls i fancy frith would like a son and heir i am sure he would and both jim and i would be the very first to congratulate him your husband is next in succession yes poor dear but frith is strong and healthy while darling jim oh i can't bear to talk about it this was perfectly true to invent sentimental domestic histories and bewail a husband she detested was difficult even to a woman of leah's imagination and tact but hengist thought it was very good of her to talk so generously and paid her serious compliments till she began to think that some unpardonable sin had thrown her into the society of this prosing creature it was like reading the dictionary or drinking homburg waters or paying bills the sight of a friend made her gasp with relief after the manner of a pearl diver rising to take the air here's lady richardson and sir billy she said with a frown for her companion's benefit so horrid to interrupt our nice conversation 
we can pass them replied hengist decidedly pleased oh i don't think so was leah's quick reply it would look rude and then fanny richardson never passes any one who will listen to her prattle of chiffon besides billy is a nice boy quite a little man don't you think so too much a man for his years said her companion austerely i do not like chesterfields in their teens the lad's manners are too good much too good can any child be much too good in the wrong way of over artificiality yes sir william he likes to be called sir billy so flippant his mother should insist she she never insists on anything except having the newest dye and the best cut frock and a few dozen male ears to pour her babble into billy can do no wrong in her eyes nor in mine he is such an admirer of women and at the age of thirteen groaned hengist come now even you must have made love to some pretty pastry cook's daughter when you were at eton there must be some of the old adam in you lord hengist i was never an entirely modern child replied the serious man evasively and with a sad eye on the trim figure of the rapidly approaching billy to think that he should take dinner pills and know the difference between sweet and dry champagne what will the next generation be boys and girls said leah flippantly good day fanny the vivacious little fairy who warmly greeted lady jim and her solemn escort was as pretty and fragile and dainty as a dresden china shepherdess and quite a credit to the mate who recreated her every morning there was nothing natural about her save her genuine admiration of billy and that arose from a knowledge that royalty had made it fashionable to exploit the nursery blonde and plump jimp and graceful dressed in perfect taste and coloured in the latest fashion she was popular even with her own discriminating sex hengist thought her a respectable doll with no particular vices and did not object to having her at the castle but he disapproved of billy the precocious which was decidedly unfair as billy could scarcely help shaping himself to the mould into which he had been slipped by a mother who required his assistance to play the pretty comedy of the widow's only son how are you leah darling so sweet you look and lord hengus too a most unexpected meeting and so delightful babbled lady richardson who talked more and said less than any society gramophone billy and i are just going to monte carlo to plunge on the red reggie lake is to meet us at the station such a nice boy lancers you know a great chum of billy's won't you come too leah to brighten billy up he's got the hump poor boy as his new nerve tonic doesn't suit him and such a lovely lovely day as it is too don't you think so lord hengist the respectable hengist's hair bristled at this incoherent speech and did not lie down again at the look in billy's eyes dressed in a particularly smart eton suit gloved and silk hatted and patent leather booted with fashionable accuracy the boy appraised lady jim's beauty in a calm way which would have made a captain of dragoons blush behind his graceful nonchalant handsome mask of youth was hidden an old old man and in many ways hengist was his junior he certainly blushed when leah gave him an amused glance but this was billy's way of mashing the sex he knew the value of youthful diffidence backed by mature knowledge should not your little boy be at school asked hengist scandalized into an implied snub sir william looked at the troubled face of his elder with the serenity of a cherub goin back next week said he carefully dropping his g's the little mother wanted me to look after her for a bit billy can't trust me out of his sight giggled lady richardson he's so afraid i'll give him a second father not reggie lake anyhow he's a rotter 
what's a rotter sir billy asked lady jim enjoying the disgusted looks of hengist a fellow who rots what an admirable definition billy rapidly dropped his left eyelid and showed a set of white teeth i don't carry coals for your newcastle he said parabolically say lady jim chuck this chappie and come to charlie's mount the wink and the speech were lost on hengist for he was being worried by lady richardson she danced before him a pretty figure gowned in burnt almond red and would have distracted his heart with daintiness but that julia kept that article in the nursery do join us lord hengist she pleaded seductively such fun when you know the ropes billy can show them to you out of the mouth of babes and sucklings quoted hengist ironically quite a new reading lady richardson now you are horrid said the widow who did not know in the least what he meant i'll tell your wife by the way how is she and the darling darling twins twins are too sweet i wish billy was a twin one of sir william is quite sufficient i'm sure i don't know what you are talking about and it's very horrid of you to say so billy is adored is he ever whipped lady richardson gave a scream how barbarous the man who tried to whip billy would have to order his coffin beforehand billy can handle his bunches of fives i can tell you lord hengist his what it's billy's way of putting boxing you should see him give the postman's knock oh he is clever he can drive a motor too and pick out the winner five times out of ten does he know the kings of england no he hasn't been to court yet and of course there's only one how funny you are well lady richardson put her head on one side like a coaxing cock robin are you coming with billy and me do oh do we have afternoon tea with monsieur aksakoff and his daughter what's that asked leah overhearing the names the russian man stiff sort of fella said young eton nothing birdish about him daughter's a clipper though say little mother we'd best get the train won't wait you know before he had finished speaking lady jim had made up her mind she had not heard from demetrius and it was not impossible that he had written to katinka in spite of his discouraging love-making he kept in with her on the chance that she might be able to procure his pardon and in any case she was useful in keeping him posted in the doings of the third section the girl was so infatuated that she never saw he was making use of her in this way and constantly wrote to him about any official gossip she heard there was something pathetic in her devotion and heart-whole love for the man who deceived her but leah did not look at the matter in this way she knew that katinka if any one would have news of the doctor and being anxious to learn how garth was progressing towards the grave she turned to hengist i think i'll go over she said in a low voice jim asked me to see m aksakoff on some business would julia mind not at all said hengist heartily and quite deceived i would escort you only i have some letters to write about the distress in london oh billy will look after us said that young gentleman's mother i have driven a team before now observed billy with dignity hengist give him a reproving look which billy bore very stoically and whispered to leah as they parted don't encourage the lad i don't think he needs much encouragement said lady jim laughing and the two women walked away with billy between them hengist stood where he was and frowned charming woman lady james he murmured gazing after leah's amethystine gown but that lad ugh he shook his head over young england up to date then returned to the villa to hear the twins say the alphabet life had its compensations even for a millionaire peer
end of chapter thirteen chapter fourteen of lady jim of curzon street this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org lady jim of curzon street by fergus hume chapter fourteen after the happy-go-lucky fashion of italian officialism the train was detained for some time at ventimiglia lady richardson unsettled as a fly changed her seat five times and complained garrulously captain lake is so very particular she explained producing a pocket mirror and a powder puff to repair possible damages he can't bear to be kept waiting five minutes then i should make him wait five hours replied leah calmly it doesn't do to spoil men you spoil me said sir billy audaciously pooh you are merely a rascal in the making i wouldn't hint how we govern your sex if you were anything but a grub the boy laughed complacently i'm a very nice grub very precocious at all events you know much more than is good for you fanny you should whip him i haven't the heart or the muscle my dear the only safe thing will be to marry a strong man with a bad temper i should jolly well like to see the stepfather who would pitch into me you will if you don't behave isn't that eyebrow a little crooked billy and she fingered it delicately don't think so but you have a smudge of powder on your chin so i have how horrid there dusting it off what a comfort you are to your darling mammy my own kiss me billy brushed her rouge with careful lips and after a glance to see that he had not blurred the picture lady richardson put away the mirror thank goodness we're moving again she prattled i do hope reggie won't be in a bad temper i'll square that little mother been to the theatres lately lady jim no answered leah amused by his man-about-town air is there anything good on awful stuff announced billy with the conviction of mature judgment couldn't sit out more than two plays the woman with three husbands isn't bad though very french of course saw it four times before i told the little mother she couldn't face it how alluring will you take me billy was obviously shocked no woman should see that piece i can't stand heaps but and after me the deluge shrug hinted at the degradation of the drama yes poor darling chimed in his mother he was blushing three inches deep all over when he came home i am glad to hear that billy can blush at all murmured lady jim how's the betting william tolerable i pulled off a fiver on fly by night but a man in my form lost a tenner silly juggins oh how old is that man sixteen and thinks he's twenty awfully saucy chap though went nap on a girl and another fellow scooped the pool don't they teach english at eton billy the youth was quite undisturbed try to he assured her but there's no snap about the classical rot they give us oh here we are and there is reggie cried lady richardson craning her dyed head out of the window like another jezebel how do you do captain lake lovely day so sorry we're late you know lady james kames i have that pleasure said the tall young soldier saluting very sorry to hear your husband is ill lady james thanks but i dare say jamaica will pull him round captain lake hope it won't breathed billy at her elbow as the lift soared why you horrid little boy there'll be a chance for me no no you're too much of a general lover billy girls do run a man so hard nowadays observed billy pathetically it was different in your youth no doubt but i am not a girl and quite old enough to box the ears of conceited urchins do if you'll let me give you a kiss for a blow what precocious christianity you had better apply to that pretty american girl near the casino door 
miss mamie mulrady oh i can ki her kisses without fightin not bad lookin is she lots of tin and a spry as they make em there's the little mother and the rotter chippin into the casino shall we follow lady jim they were stopped on the steps by miss mulrady who knew both and claimed acquaintance through a wholly unnecessary lorgnette she was a vivacious wild west product who exaggerated the vernacular because europeans expected to find the california girl of fiction in real life her exaggerated slang was assumed out of sheer amusement and she greatly enjoyed the amazed looks of those who heard her talk good anglo-saxon which she did when she escaped from fools to foregather with wise men how are you miss mulrady asked billy solemnly keepin afloat i guess but that's about all the dollars i've lost buckin the tiger would have bought me a dozen husbands foreign ones are cheap i believe said leah admiring the prairie flowers paris frock more than her republican manner you make me smile i'm goin to run tandem with sir billy here me first and he the wheeler no go said the boy quite able to hold his own i'm not goin to marry a bret hart girl oh do replied miss mulrady in the purest of english and placing two small gloved hands together i'll be a wife and a mother in one what economy smiled lady jim are you coming in to the devil's parlour later i'm waiting for mr askew leah started she thought that askew was safe in shropshire making attempts to civilise the fixture harry askew that's so assented miss mulrady relapsing into her wild west vocabulary and with a keen look he called on mamo and me when he was cruisin out frisco way we're negotiatin a system to break this old bank you evidently wish to be popularised in a song said lady jim languidly how long has mr askew been devoting his energies to such things this with an angry reflection that he had not called on her you might reckon it twenty-four hours said the american admiring her pointed brown shoe he's here for his health i've heard that excuse before with regard to monte carlo shouldn't wonder we ticket our sins best sugar sir billy come along and buy me candy at the stores but your man miss mulrady the askew chap lady jim and i'll swap humans what say and she looked at leah mischievously overdoing the slang i never swap what isn't my own property answered lady jim considering this offer too western and resenting the familiarity to the extent of walking into the casino with her head very much in the air america could hold her own with the mother country and leah did not approve she wants to be the whole show in the box office murmured mamie mischievously stay here bub i am sorry to refuse a lady replied billy resenting the word but i've put my money on lady jim this trip on the red hair you mean go bye bye with your nurse then here's mr askew he's older than you and easier to please snapped the youth much offended you'll excuse me miss mulrady but a man can't keep a woman waitin he retired into what lady jim called the devil's parlour with a floria etona air and miss mulrady after a glance at the ears which she longed to box soundly turned to receive a breathless apology from the belated askew there's a friend of yours gone in to sin for an hour said she when a treaty was concluded i have so many friends so called of the high-toned gilt-edged sort with red scalps askew comprehended in a second lady jim he stammered yes i heard that she was at san remo what's she doing here visitin the sick and the poor said mamie shrewdly it's what folks come to monte for guess she best drop in on you a sicker man i never saw and you'll be poor enough by the time we're through with this old system of yours i know a bank where the wild time goes you may look all through bacon without findin that remark it's my own let's get 
thus with barbaric japes did the child of nature lead her companion into the gilded halls of iniquity and the two jostled the well-dressed crowd which circulated round the tables the silence was that of an arctic night save for the droning voices of the croupier and at times a hurried whisper of joy or dismay going in for rouge et noir with lady jim asked miss mulrady alluding to the hair of askew and his friend or perhaps she's sportin on trente et quarante to suit her years she's under thirty growled askew crossly and you're under the weather considerable retorted the american sharply get up steam and fizzle a bit can't you shall i war whoop or dance a hornpipe neither i prefer originality try the system then and askew pushed his way through the mammon worshippers to where the roulette ball wheeled its fatal round lady jim did not play she had stupidly forgotten her peacock's feather and could not risk loss with her small capital but billy having the audacity and luck of innocence was at hand so she gave him five hundred francs to experiment we'll have the winnings never take money from a woman said billy gravely but i don't mind a fly got any sportin number thirteen because that's your age there is mademoiselle aksakoff i wish to speak to her and she moved gracefully towards the tall pale girl while young iniquity with the air of a vanderbilt planked her money on the odd number katinka aksakoff grew crimson when lady jim saluted her and would have evaded the meeting if possible she might have been a nun from the looks of her and was garbed in unrelieved black which leah concluded was mourning for unrequited affection after that fleeting wave of colour her thin oval face grew marble white and a pair of dark questioning eyes appeared twice as large and three times as brilliant as they had been before resting on lady jim's gracious smile so glad to meet you murmured leah as they shook hands in the air lady richardson and i have come to tea where is your father he is talking with the german ambassador replied katinka without a smile and with siberian coldness so fortunate we can chat without interruption i scarcely think we have much to chat about oh yes rejoined lady jim with perfect good humour when you learn how you misjudge me we shall get on capitally pardon i do not understand probably not since i have yet to make my explanation let us walk on the terrace and you can throw me over to where they shoot the pigeons if my conversation displeases you ah but it is so strange and so necessary to your peace of mind no mademoiselle aksakoff's face grew scarlet once more and she pressed her hand to her heart as though she felt there a cruel pain perhaps she did poor soul but the stoicism of the slav enabled her to summon up a wry smile and to bow her head as she followed her brilliant rival with the excess of an ill-governed passionate heart did she hate this woman but as a niobe frozen and cold did she appear when they were pacing the terrace and not one single word of her companion's sugared speech was she prepared to believe leah's eyes rested appreciatively on the varied beauty of god's work and man's improvements the huddled white houses of monaco crowned its giant rock which bulked hugely against the blended azure of sea and sky the placid waters ringed its base with foam and stretched with sparks and dashes of fire towards an immeasurable horizon landward bunched the red roofs of the town below arid and precipitous heights soaring massively into the radiant and ever-deepening blue a balming wind like some invisible alchemist changed the sombre green of the olive groves to patches of glittering silver 
near at hand spread the lustrous foliage of lemon and orange trees nor was wanting the almond blossom of the far east they walked under palms suggestive of bedouin life and to the well read of heine's sad little song immortal and heart-rendingly true roses and violets and flowers of many shapes and hues bordered the terrace the wide sea laughed at their feet and behind them rose the palatial structure of the casino gorgeous as the golden house of nero it was fairyland and lady jim said so to her sad companion who was too blinded by love to see beauty anywhere when the beloved was absent we can talk in french if you like said leah after she had paid her tribute to nature in english i think replied the russian girl my father wishes me to speak only your tongue while we remain in london so that i may improve you can't answered leah genuinely complimentary your accent is much better than a born english person also your grammar and your choice of words we take the trouble to learn your language whereas you english do not we're too busy annexing the world to bother about philological lessons said lady jim remembering heine's remark anent the romans possibly assented katinka with a chilling smile but interesting as this conversation is i do not see its necessity monsieur demetrius began leah abruptly when mademoiselle raised a protesting hand we need not speak of him madame why not he is a mutual friend i know your fancy i fancy nothing interrupted the other haughtily words are not needed where he is concerned but explanations are you think that i love demetrius katinka flushed painfully and she put her hand suddenly to her throat i forbid you to speak she said in a stifled voice nonsense we are not in russia where people kneel down and say please besides it is necessary for your peace of mind that you should hear what i have to say you made that remark before lady james true and i make it again to emphasize my meaning though i hate repetition demetrius loves you no no it is you who pish his heart is yours his science mine his science mademoiselle aksakoff looked surprised what else do you think attracted me i am an english cat and i have no lovers do you remember la fontaine's fable lady james be plain with me i am trying to be you think that i love demetrius that he is devoted to me it is not so katinka winced she did not like such plain speaking and moreover doubted its truth if i could think so i would of course you can think so said lady jim amiably demetrius is particularly clever in curing consumptive diseases for that reason i conversed with him a great deal my husband is very ill and i wanted the doctor to cure him if demetrius thought that my liking for his society meant anything else he is an egotist my advice is that you should procure his pardon and marry him there are obstacles in the way i am not one i assure you are you speaking honestly i am and the eyes of the two women met katinka searched the hard blue orbs of the great lady with painful intensity and leah bore the scrutiny with the knowledge that her conduct had been and always would be perfectly correct had she been the least in love with the doctor she would not have dared to submit to that probing painful gaze women may deceive mere men they cannot deceive one another especially in affairs of the heart when katinka withdrew her eyes she was satisfied that lady jim cared nothing for demetrius without explanation she burst into rapid and wrathful speech and leah's feminine perspicacity enabled her to guess the uttered preamble which a man would have required to be put into words 
why then do you lure him to your feet cried the russian girl in a sharp pained voice if you love him not why torture him and me i know he loves you i know i know oh yes i know you do not his love for me if it can be called so is the mere passing fancy of a man for a woman who has been kind to him too kind muttered katinka vengefully not at all but men are so conceited that they think a woman's smile means a woman's love you have a golden heart yet you throw it into the greedy hands of this selfish egotist he is not that gasped the girl yes he is and much worse demetrius possesses the selfishness of a woman and the vanity of a man you reverse the proper order no i don't men are far vainer than women and women more selfish than men i'm selfish myself therefore i am happy you are one of those self-tormenting self-denying angels who make men what they are vain greedy conceited lord of creation beasts and i insult the beasts by such a comparison i thought you liked men i use them and i detest them retorted lady jim speaking more plainly than was her custom there are good men i don't deny that for i know one at least she was thinking of lionel but the majority ugh god help the women like yourself who give their hearts into the keeping of such animals you love your husband surely we all love our husbands it's part of the church service to love them pa i am not here to talk of my marriage but of yours you know now that i don't care for demetrius and that i desired his help merely for my husband's sake yes i have wronged you and katinka put out her hand lady jim took it rather softened you poor child how foolish you are why not forget demetrius i cannot he is not worthy of you is he not ah you don't know him leah smiled grimly i know him much better than you do however if you insist upon putting him on an imaginary pedestal there is no more to be said have you heard from him lately mademoiselle aksakoff was now quite deceived and looked upon lady jim as her dearest and best friend last week i received a letter from funchal she said eagerly yes i wrote to him about the chances of his pardon are there any chances yes yes i assure you yes i have a cousin high in favour with the czar who can procure an immediate pardon but my father does not wish me to marry demetrius wise man murmured leah and so there is some difficulty oh she clasped her hands if constantine would only be guided by me he comes of a rich family and has the title of prince so he told me ah but did he say how he had parted from his family because of his advanced ideas he gave up money and rank and all that makes life pleasant to labour among the poor peasants is that not noble so noble that i have difficulty in thinking m demetrius acted so but he did he did and my father is angered because of this self-sacrifice if constantine would only return to the rank of life in which he was born my father would permit me to marry him and then the pardon would speedily be procured but i plead in vain she murmured with hanging head he will not listen he may when he returns volunteered lady jim kindly but when will that be if he goes to jamaica leah turned suddenly white why to jamaica she asked sharply he wrote that the duke of pentland had asked him to go there to see after your husband and you say that yes yes but this patient garth who katinka looked surprised but 
have you not heard heard i have heard nothing i do not correspond with monsieur demetrius my dear it is now april and he has been at funchal since january trying to heal that poor man has he no said mademoiselle aksakoff quickly the man is dead garth dead lady jim sat down with a gasp yes so demetrius wrote last week and said he would go on to jamaica at the duke's request to see your husband but you look quite ill i hate to hear of deaths said lady jim viciously she certainly spoke truly with regard to this particular death in her mind lurked a dread lest demetrius had assisted nature after all End of chapter 14